Chesapeake Bay stretches 200 miles from Virginia to Maryland, affecting around 17 million people. The bay and its tributaries have 11,684 miles of shoreline, which is more than the entire west coast. With an average depth of 21 feet, the bay holds 18 trillion gallons of water. About 150 streams, creeks, and rivers flow into the bay, providing it with 51 billion gallons of fresh water a day. Within all this water, the bay holds 2,700 species of plants and animals. These animals and plants help to provide over 500 million pounds of seafood per year to the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. A major issue in the Chesapeake Bay is the amount of pollution. Most of the pollution enters the bay through wastewater, agricultural, stormwater, and air pollution. These pollutants include chemicals such as mercury, PCBs, and PEAHs. These chemicals do not break down easily and persist in the environment for many years. Another major issue is dead zones. These occur when excessive nitrate and phosphorus pollution from human activities cause very low amounts of oxygen. Fish, crabs, oysters, and other aquatic animals can't live in dead zones because they would suffocate. This pollution affects professional and recreational fishermen and crabbers all across the bay. Tim and Carrie are recreational watermen who have lived on the bay for the past 19 years. Tim McDonough. Hi, I'm Carrie. Uh, what was the condition of the bay like when you first moved? It was a lot different. We had a lot of grass along the shoreline. Uh, we had a lot more birds, some of which were uh, swans that unfortunately you know, have since gone away, but uh, you know they pull the grass out. The, one of the things that we've seen a big difference is the, is the amount of uh, over, I'll say, clamming, and uh, the, the, gym, the guys come closer and closer to the shoreline, so they're tearing up the bottom of our very fragile shelf here on, at, on Eastern Bay, and the grasses have all but disappeared. Well, we're boaters, uh, but we also occasionally fish and crab. And, you know, it's a balance every year between the amount of fish versus the amount of crabs. And of course, the reduction in the grass eliminates where the babies can hide from the predatory bigger fish and bigger clams. So without our grasses, you know, we've got not the cycle that we used to have. Mm -hmm. Crabs are not quite as plentiful. They're not quite as big as they used to be. The bay is definitely cleaner than it was, you know, but you're talking about tributaries that dump into the bay. A lot has been done, you know, on those tributaries to clean them up so that the bay is much cleaner, like the Potomac River, which was extremely filthy to the point that people did not use it for recreational purposes, and that dumped right into the bay. The Potomac is now much, much cleaner because the factories have cleaned up into the Potomac. And I think there's been a more conscious effort for people who live along the, the coast to uh, stop using chemicals and pesticides and fertilizers on their property. Although we still see people doing that, uh, we, we and some of our neighbors have stopped using those things that we know are going to run into the bay and create damage to, to the natural habitat. In talking with another local resident, Susie Smith, who sells seafood for a living, she gave us some insight on observations she has made about the health of the bay. She has lived on the Chesapeake Bay since 1963. Much of the area in the 60s was farmland and there were very few homes. Because few people lived there at the time, there was less activity on the water. Through her years, she has noticed many changes on the bay. One change that she has noticed from when she started selling seafood until now is that there have been a lot of over-harvesting of seafood in the bay. Another problem she mentioned is the introduction of invasive species to the tributaries of the bay. The specific species that she referenced was the introduction of the Blue Channel catfish to the Potomac and Patuxent rivers, two major tributaries of the bay. The Blue Channel catfish has no predators and eats almost everything, which is a problem for the species that are native to the bay. She said crabs and fish used to be much more plentiful and you could catch as many as you wanted. A problem for the crabs is that there isn't much bay grass anymore which is a problem for juvenile fish. Crabs and fish use the bay grass as cover from predators. The crabs that are being caught now are also much smaller because of the high demand around the world. And because of this high demand, prices of crabs have, ris have risen greatly. In effort to help the crab populations in the bay, Susie also said that there have been regulations against when commercial crabbers can catch female crabs and the size of the crabs that can be kept. There are also regulations on which seasons, days, and hours you are allowed to crab. Steve Don is a local charter fishing captain who works for Chesapeake Bay Sport Fishing. 
He has worked on the bay since he was 12. I started uh, working on the bay when I was about 12. Crab pot with my dad. And then um, when I was 14, I got my first boat in crab pots. I still have the boat now. And I've done that off and on until about six or seven years ago. Um, I stopped because we uh, started running the charter boat. And I uh, got busy with that full time. So now that's all I do is fish. situation like crabs and fish changed when you started and now? Uh, the fish have been up and down but it's still pretty good. Um, the crabs have definitely declined. Uh, the, uh, the wholesale price has gone up some, you know, a good bit. Now I would say for males, pretty much the standard's about $100. Which is a little better wholesale. Um, it seems like the, the retail price seems to be really high and it seems to stay fixed throughout the year. Um, you know, high prices for a dozen, 75 and 80 dollars a dozen for big crabs. Um, and it just, it rarely comes down. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't react to supply and demand like it used to. Um, where people can get them cheaper, you know, when they're more plentiful. Going 1993. He pointed out the cost of seafood, specifically crabs, when he first started up his restaurant. He was originally able to buy premium crabs from the local area for around $25 a bushel. Now, he says, the current price that he has to pay is over $225 a bushel. One of the reasons for the price increase, he said, was overcrabbing. He said that overcrabbing prevents crabs from reaching spawning areas and tributaries of the bay. Along with the price rise, he said that these crabs are also unreliable. This causes him to have to import crabs from Louisiana and Texas, which are also not the most reliable, with the death rates of crabs during transportation being very high. He also said the lack of oysters has been a major issue, but it is improving. In the southern bay, mechanical dredging, which is the removal of sediment with the use of the bucket, which acts as a till for oysters. This has caused there to be more oysters now than there has been in the past 25 years. Oysters are important to the bay because one oyster can filter 28 gallons of water a day. An issue that he cited as a cause to pollution is the lack of catch basins for chemical runoff and parking lots near the bay. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation, founded in 1967, plays a major role in helping to restore the bay to the condition it once was. It's the largest foundation that exclusively works towards helping the bay to improve. Okay, hi, my name is Doug Myers. I'm the Maryland Senior Scientist for Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Well, the health of the bay is always changing. It's a large system, and there's about 17 million people living in a watershed about 64,000 square miles. That's a big uh, potential impact. A lot of us, uh, what we're doing on an everyday basis has an effect on the bay, mostly because rainfall uh, runs onto the land and it picks up pollutants and carries them into the bay. Uh, the biggest uh, sources of pollution come from nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. There's a lot of our human activities that bring those particular pollutants into the bay. And when they get there, uh, they have a tendency to turn the bay a little bit uh, pea soup green. Right now it's uh, on its way there. It's uh, fairly early in the season as we have these longer uh, days with more daylight and more uh, warmer temperatures. The phytoplankton, the microscopic plants, will start to grow. Uh, they'll make the water much greener. Uh, most of the time, that is the basis of the food chain, and that's really important for the health of the bay. Almost everything eats something that eats the phytoplankton in the bay. 
um, the zooplankton or the little animals that would be grazing them down, they do their best um, trying to get uh, those populations under control, but we have so many nutrients going into the bay that the phytoplankton continue to grow well beyond populations that can be grazed by the zooplankton. When that happens, the excess uh, algae cells die, they go to the bottom, and as they're decomposing, they'll use up the dissolved oxygen that's available for fish and crabs and oysters and everything else to breathe. So we have this dead zone, this very large area in the middle of the bay, that has uh, very low dissolved oxygen, and it's uh, stressful for some fish and crabs, and it's lethal uh, if it gets uh, low enough. Almost every year we have two dead zones that set up during the course of the year, an early summer and a late summer dead zone, uh, within between times where the water quality improves well enough for things to survive. So there's a large effort across the bay to reduce the loading of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, those three main pollutants. Yeah, the bay has been improving. We have some data coming from the Potomac River in particular, uh, where there's been a large investment in sewage treatment plant upgrades. Uh, there's uh, funding sources in Maryland. Uh, if you live in Maryland, you probably pay the flush fee, which is part of your water bill. And that goes to capitalize a fund that does uh, wastewater uh, treatment plant upgrades. Uh, the current standard is called enhanced nutrient removal. And when you uh, do that to a sewage treatment plant, you can bring the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, loads from those plants much, much lower than they were previously. So the Potomac, where that's been happening for about 10 years, we're starting to see lower chlorophyll rates, which means less uh, phytoplankton in the water, and a return to the submerged aquatic vegetation, those bay grasses that are super important in the ecosystem. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, engages in a bunch of different ways to help the bay. One uh, is our education program. We have the largest environmental education program in the country with the largest non-commercial fleet of vessels, uh, including work boats, kayaks, canoes, uh, skipjack, sailboat. Um, all of those are used to teach students, principals, and, and uh, teachers um, how to incorporate Bay learning lessons into the classroom and learn more about the Bay and the impacts folks have on it. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, work in the state capitals. We're here in Annapolis and we're able to engage with the state government uh, and to uh, work on policies like phosphorus management and farms or stormwater fees and things like that that would reduce those pollutant loads. We also will sometimes sue the EPA or some other uh, federal state agency for not doing their job. Um, and then finally, we, we do on the ground restoration, both in uh, uh, planting trees, uh, we do some uh, wetlands plantings along the shoreline, and we put out millions and millions of uh, oysters spat on shell, the little tiny um, newly metamorphosed oysters that uh, just became uh, Sub-adults, they've uh, gone through their metamorphosis from a larvae, they settle onto a shell, we'll settle, settle them onto shells at our oyster restoration program, and uh, then put them out in the bay to, to grow out. My name's uh, Hope Walzak, and I think I've loved the Bay all my life. I know I've been connected to it all my life. Uh, I can remember when I was maybe 10 or 11, walking these same waters that we're talking from now, and all the shoreline was sand. There were no bulkheads, no rip riprap, and we used to take an inner tube with the dip net and just walk for miles and catch crabs and soft crabs. And I've been retired about 11 years, and it was always a dream of mine that once I retired that I would get into oyster farming, and I did. So I did the uh, oyster farming for about three years. The problem with it being on Eastern Bay is that the oysters have to be submerged in water almost all through the winter months, and here the tide goes out. So while I was oyster farming, I had to take the oysters over to a friend's and let them winter over. Unfortunately, what happened was a lot of boat traffic came into that inlet 
and uh, I had to stop oyster farming because the residue from the boats got into my spats. But I was able to do it for three years and I was able to turn in some really nice sized oysters and it really made me feel good. Uh, what they did was they took the oysters from all the, the farmers and they actually put them on a reef out in the bay, which was uh, an isolated place, which was a place that no one was allowed, you know, to, to oyster on. Uh, and then again, once we retired, I, uh, my husband and I used to run a thousand foot trot line, and uh, it, it was amazing at the quantity of crabs we could catch, let alone the fun. And, and at that time, the clarity of the water was unbelievable. But we could go over a thousand foot trot line and catch almost a bushel of crabs in August. Now, last summer when my husband and I went crabbing, we went out into No Names Creek and for three hours we got six legal keepable crabs. So it was kind of disheartening that you had to see that uh, the bay really is not as abundant as it once was. And, uh, and, and I, I guess I don't know the reasons, if it was pollution, if it was over harvesting of our crabs. I know one of the reasons that we're having difficulty with the crabs is the lack of bay grass. So um, the, the bay grass right out front here where Alex is filming used to be so thick that as we went out to crab we had to lift up our motors and actually get the bay grass off the motor so that we could continue. But um, it was really thick and we had all kinds of uh, marine life and definitely soft crabs. And I guess what I really want to impress, and I know for me, for out my life, the bay has always been a gift. And I think you try to do everything in your power to, to keep it healthy, to keep it pristine. I know I'm not the only one, but you know a lot of other people that live on the water will not use fertilizers on their lawn. And I do think every little bit helps, and I think using detergents without phosphate when you wash your clothes uh, is helping the bay to improve. But it is such a gift, and I think it is so important that the next generation, and the next generation, and the generation after that get to really appreciate it and enjoy it and, and see its beauty and its bounty.